So Daniel part two is one of these, uh, it's the, the book of Daniel. There's so many different angles. Uh, obviously, as a pastor, I can bring out so much different things out of each book. Uh, that's not necessarily the theme of the book. The theme of the book is a promise. There's a promise, and not only is there a promise, there's a pattern that takes place. And that pattern is this, is that human beings will become beasts when they don't acknowledge God's kingdom. And you'll see that God will one day confront the beast and rescue his world. So you see that uh, through Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 and even with his son in chapter 5. Now, with this, this is a beautiful book. Now, the book is the key to the book of Revelation. If you can figure out the key, great. Is it a, um, a necessary key to have as a Christian? I, I, I'm not going to say that. It's the same thing with learning Hebrew. Learning Hebrew is a beautiful thing if, if you have the talent, the ability, but it doesn't make you a better Christian, okay? Does it help you in understanding the fullness of the language that it was written in the, the Bible? Sure. Uh, some words uh, will continue to just uh, blow up in your face of excitement, of like, whoa, I didn't know that's what the word, this is what it was saying. Um, for instance, when I tell my wife I love her, that word is great and it's beautiful, but that love word it just continues to amplify. There's more that needs to be said. And my wife, I can say that to her. And when I say, baby, I love you, she knows what that means. It doesn't just stop at love. It continues of like, oh, I know what you mean when you say love, right? She also knows what I mean when I'm like, I love you. And that means like, do something for me, right? She knows that moment too. But with the book of Daniel, is there so many, is there, are there layers? There are so many layers. Is it for you to be, um, uh, I guess, diligent slash Eager? Yes, it is up to you. Will you become a better Christian? There's no such thing as a better Christian. If you believe in Jesus Christ, your Lord and personal Savior, guess what? You're a Christian. And you being a Christian, that means that you walk in love. You walk in the ways of, of our God, okay, of what he's given us, his word. And that's being a Christian. Is it fun to read the book of Daniel? Absolutely. Will you just gain so much wisdom and knowledge out of it? Yes. Do you have to know and understand the key to the book of Revelation? No. And I say that reluctantly, meaning I don't want it to be a deterrent on you wanting to read the Word of God. I want you to be excited about reading the Word of God, but I want you to be realistic on it, meaning um, should you spend more time in the book of Daniel than you do on Netflix? Yes. yes. Is that happening? Probably not. <laughs> Because you do look at the book of Daniel as some heaviness. You go, whoa, there's some stuff in here I just don't understand. And even Daniel didn't even understand it. He didn't. That's the reason why you see, uh, you see angels appearing to him. Michael, they're appearing to him and explaining the visions that Daniel was having. So do you see that correlation for even you to realize that there's some heaviness to this? Daniel even said, I don't understand what's happening. And Michael's like, don't worry. Gabriel, don't worry. They're telling him, I've got it. I'm going to show you and share with you what it means. So you get it? I just have to say those things because I don't want you to walk out of here going, not for me. I'm going home and watching television today. Or I'm, I'm not even going to try to open up the Bible to understand it because it's hard. It's not hard. You have to go to the Father in heaven first. You go to your Father in heaven and you say, all right, God, I want to know this. I want to know your ways. Your ways are higher than my ways. I want to know your knowledge because your knowledge is a way better than my knowledge. Your understanding, way higher than my understanding. I want the Holy Spirit to direct me the right path for me right now. Talking to the Holy Spirit and saying, Holy Spirit, instruct me in God's ways. God, show me all of that you have for me. And God will direct you and he'll show you. I promise you. It's a moment where you start reading. You're like, all right, stop. Oh, I don't need to read that. There's got to be something else I need to read. And God will instruct you. I promise you. It's awesome when you start listening to God. All right. So I say all that because there is one scripture. Or there's, a few, there's a couple of scriptures right here, too, actually. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. If there are two scriptures that have the most importance out of the book of Daniel, these to me are the most important, too. And the reason is because it comes 500 plus years before it even happened. 500 years before it even happened. And that's the coolest part about Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. As my vision continued that night, 
I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Guys, there is no cooler two scriptures in all of the book than this right here. And the reason is, is this. It's true. Think about this. When you hear someone ask the question, do you believe in Jesus? And they respond with no. You got to go to these two scriptures and go, but wouldn't you believe that every race, I mean, Jesus is it, legit. Not, not only the side of being a Christian and you're like, I've got other ways to prove that Jesus Christ is real. But alone with these two scriptures, it's true. Jesus Jesus hasn't faded away. There's been many of gods, and I put quotations or marks around that, fake gods that are not real, not the true God, that have faded away. They, they don't mean anything. And yet Jesus, still to this day, all of this is true. That alone is proof, is evidence. And my, if, like I'm trying to point out this morning, my plea for you, if you get into any scripture in the book of Daniel, these two right here, study these two out. Go throughout all the rest of the chapters or in all the rest of the books. If you see Jeremiah and all the different other prophets, Ezekiel, you see these and you'll see a, a common thread weaved in because the Old Testament's always pointing to the New Testament and the New Testament's always confirming the Old Testament. And with that weaving in and out, man, you're just like, this is, this is beautiful. So it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's just beautiful. So those are the two, if anything, I want you to get out of this. Now, I'm going to go off. Here's my message this morning. In the book of Genesis, chapter 5, verse 24, you see a man named Enoch. Now, Enoch was very unique. And Enoch comes in, and we sum, this is speculation, okay? So don't quote Pastor Josh to say what he said. If another man shows up during tribulation and it's not Enoch, you don't come try to find me in heaven and be like, hey, you're wrong. <laughs> All right? It's kind of pointless. It's a little over. Okay? So, <laughs> but Enoch is believed to be one of the prophets that will be here the first three and a half years of the seven years of tribulation. Okay? The other one would be Elijah. And the reason is because those are the only two that didn't die of a physical death. All right. You have to die of a physical death before judgment of some sort. OK, the long story. You can read that out. But those are speculations of end times, philosophy, theology and all that good stuff. All right. So my approach to you is just to talk about Enoch this morning. Enoch was very unique in such a way he pressed into God. It says in Genesis chapter five, verse 24, that he walked with God. Now, prior to that, you didn't see that happen other than with Adam. But now he says he walked with God. Now, this is pretty cool because Enoch is also believed to have at that time uh, prophesied about the coming of Jesus Christ and even the second coming. Now, this is really cool because there's two other people that in the word of God that really walked with God on a deeper level. Now, Elijah obviously was deep. Moses was deep. Abraham was deep. But there's two others in the word of God that are special. One being Daniel. All right. And you'll see it here in a second and I'll read about it. But he was beloved. The second one other outside of Enoch. So you got Enoch, you got Daniel. And the, the third one here would be John. John the beloved. Now, what's beautiful about John is, is that when he wrote his book, he actually even he actually named himself the one whom Jesus loved. He actually never, he never used his name. It was always the one, the disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Uh, it wasn't a cockiness. It wasn't like this idea of, oh, look at me. I'm the one who Jesus loved. It was an identification that he walked in because he knew that Jesus loved him. Right. And that is special. Now, these three, what's unique about them is, is they were all given revelation of revelation of the book. They were all given that revelation of the end time, of what's about to take place. It's pretty special to think about. So I want to I talk about that. 
What is it? Now, some of you, you're like, oh, I want to be that. I hope and pray that you are. And we actually have a benefit greater than what anyone prior to Jesus's day had. And that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've been given the comforter, the guide. And that does give it us, gives us a slight advantage, if not a huge advantage, over some of the old day people. Okay? So what I love is, is that with Enoch, Enoch was taken up. God couldn't handle the fact that he was separated. He knew that there needed to be a savior. God did. But God took Enoch early. And how that happened, I don't know. All it says was he was there and then he wasn't. So Enoch goes up to be with God. What a miraculous, cool graphic statement of taking him up into heaven. But Daniel is considered as beloved, and so is John. Now, as I pointed out with John, him naming himself, on top of that, let's give you, I want to give you one more little kind of stamp of approval with John that would make you say, yeah, he was beloved. There was a moment here, and you see it in John chapter 13, verses 23, where Peter wanted to know who was going to deny Christ. Well, Peter had a relationship with Jesus, just like all the rest of them. But Jesus actually leaned in on John to ask the question. This should tell you something. I don't know about you, but I, I work for my father-in-law. Working for your father-in-law is kind of fun. <laughs> um, it was difficult. Being a youth and college pastor there, there was a lot of things that I wanted accomplished. Well, do you think that I went straightly, like straight to my father-in-law? No, I went through my wife. Why? Because my wife has that relationship. I'd call her. I'd be, I had an office beside my father-in-law. I could easily have just walked over, knocked on the door and said, Hey, Pastor Huffman, I was thinking about doing this with the youth. No, I never did that. I called her. I called her and I said, Hey, ask your dad if we can do this. And she's like, Okay, no problem. Why? Because she just had that relationship. So that's the same thing that Peter did with John. He leaned over and he said, hey, John, ask Jesus who's going to deny him. So it kind of gives you an instance here of that beloved. You also see it on the cross at the end. Jesus points out one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Oh, I love it. He points out to Mary. He points out to John. He says, John, he said, this is my mom. This is, this is your mom. Take care of her. Mary, this is John. Take care of him. I mean, it was one of the most beautiful things ever. I mean, it really is. So John is right there at the cross. It's a, it's a beautiful statement. Well, you see that there's something here. With these three, Enoch, Daniel, and John, something comes out. You see humility, you see faithfulness, and you see loyalty. So I want to bring this out with Daniel this morning. In Daniel chapter 9, something takes place that I think should be an alarm for everyone in this room. If you knew that Jesus was coming back in two weeks, what would be your to-do list? Now, some of you be like, I'm jumping out of an airplane. I'm going to Tahiti. I'm going to go and kick it back and do nothing. Tell my job to shove it. <laughs> it's not really a great approach, right? This idea of just kind of like, I'm going to do nothing. I remember years ago, I think it was in 2008, there was billboards everywhere. Jesus is coming back here and something. It was like a month or so and everyone was selling their things on Craigslist. And it was nuts. It was completely a false prophet type of deal. And so it was really sad. Well, what's really sad about it is, is that people were they were they weren't really doing much. They were putting up billboards and they were going around with signs and telling everybody. But I really believe, the reason why I say they weren't doing much is because I believe if they really would have gotten on their hands and knees, the Holy Spirit would have corrected them and said, no, you're misleading people. You're wrong. You're corrupting what I have planned. And you're, you're diminishing what, what is about to take place. That when it takes place, the great revival, you're hurting this. Okay? So I don't believe they were doing what they were supposed to do. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, he does the complete opposite of what maybe some of us would do. So my course correction this morning is hopefully you will, you will read this and you'll walk away going, you know, I got to be excited. Because when you read John, see, when John had the revelation of, for the book of Revelation, he wrote that. And then a lot of churches got, they got confused when they read the book of Revelation. So John actually wrote one, two, and three to help 
bring down their, their, I guess their nervousness or their confusion of what was about to take place. So he wrote John in saying, or John 1, 2, 3, he, he wrote him and said, hey, this is, this is really what needs to be focused on. And it all centered around love and the relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing that you can have. So for you this morning, your love and your compassion for the ones that are around you are so important. It's so important to see fit that you are encouraging them. You are bringing them to the revelation of God's love in their life. That is our key goal and vision of our church. It's the reason why we say, find a better way. Find God's way. The world has put so many different ways in front of us. They're all wrong and they mis they're misleading. They take us down paths of emptiness. And so for us as individuals that are strong in our faith, are strong in our walk of truth and relentless for God's love, the faithfulness that Daniel, John, and Enoch have all shown, that's what we should be striving and pursuing so that we can hear revelation of what's next, the new next thing of, God, what do you have? God, what's, what's next? I don't know about you guys, but I don't like waking up in the morning just kind of like, ah, oh, this is my day. Hope everything pans out. <laughs> No, I like waking up knowing that my God's in charge of my day right. and that I, I allow him to lead me and instruct me. And so that's why it's important when you hear John say, I'm the one whom Jesus loved. He realized that God loved him so much. When you hear that Daniel gets the revelation from the angel that he's beloved, Daniel walks with the sureness of, oh, God loves me. When Enoch is walking with God, he's walking with God. It's a hand-in-hand -hand moment that they're walking and they're understanding. He's understanding the ways of God. Of This is it. This is how I should be walking. This is the same pursuing nature that we should have in our relationship with God. And so Daniel does something really awesome. Now, this is the first year of the reign of Darius. Now, you see it in Daniel chapter 9. Now, I'm going to skip to verse 2. And it says, During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of, of the Lord, as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. Now, I want to stop there for just a second. Because inside of this, in the, inside of that scripture, this is important for you that are searching after the key to Revelation. In verse 2, you notice that Daniel didn't use Jeremiah's words in his book as figuratively. It was legit. When he read the book of Jeremiah, it wasn't like, oh, he's talking figuratively. It was, no, this is absolutes. This is real. It's not metaphors. It's not symbolism. It's legit. Think about that when you read everything else, okay? So in verse 2, you see, he read Jeremiah the prophet. So in verse 3, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O oh Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Now I want to skip down to verse 10. I love the number 10. Do you guys remember that from last week? Verse 10. We, hands and feet, we have not obeyed the Lord our God. For we have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants, the prophets. Do you see that? Daniel wasn't pointing to God and saying, why did you do this to us? Why are you about to curse us? Why are you about to pour out fire and hell and brimstone upon us? No, he said, we have not obeyed the Lord our God. For we have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants, the prophets. And I love it. Because remember the story I told you a few months ago, a friend of mine was a pastor. And there was a woman who was in sin in his church. So unfortunately, the person that was in charge 
came up to her and they said, hey, and they did it with love and they did it biblically. They didn't do it out of herd or gossip. They did it biblically. They walked up and they said, hey, can I meet with you? And they met with her and they took her off to the side alone. And they said, hey, listen, we've understood that that your lifestyle doesn't match up to the standards and lifestyle of the word of God. And we're coming to you to, to talk about correction. We want to see what's best for you. They didn't stand on the problem. They brought the solution. They said, we see a path that you're on that's not fruitful. And we want to be here for you. We want to help you. We want to build you up. We, we want to walk with you with this. And you know what her response was? I refuse. She walked out bitter and hurt. Instead of receiving correction. Now we know that Paul told Timothy that it was edifying. The word of God is edifying. And that we do use it for correction. And it's to build people up. It's not to tear people down. And I know getting corrected, it hurts. I've been corrected before. It hurts. It's not fun, okay? It, it does, it, you're like, ugh. But you have a choice in this moment. So that woman walked away hurt. And she went around gossiping and talking all kinds of crazy stuff. That church won't let me serve. They think they're better. And they kept, she was spilling all this stuff. So the pastor called her up and said, hey, can I meet with you? She says, absolutely. I want to tell you a piece of my mind, right? So she comes into the office. And so he allows her to speak. And sure enough, she just speaks her mind. You, your church, and this, and, and blah, blah, blah. And so he said, he said, all right. He said, listen, you can serve. Because her biggest problem is, you won't let me serve with the children. You, know, you won't let me teach the children. And he says, no, 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 you can teach the kids. Oh, I never said you weren't allowed. We never said you couldn't teach the kids. You're more than willing to teach the kids. We want you to. We want you to. We're not stopping you. She goes, oh, really? He says, we're not stopping you. You're stopping you. She goes, well, what do you mean? She goes, it's not us. It's the sin you've allowed to come in. And it's hurting not only you, but hurting people around you. Unfortunately, you're not seeing the errors of your ways, but the word of God clearly states right here. And immediately she realized, I see this now. She allowed anger and bitterness, and she, she became resentful towards the church. She, it, was, it was their problem, not her problem. But, and the revelation hit of, I'm not stopping you from teaching the kids. Your sin is stopping you from teaching the kids. This is the same approach that God gave his people with Moses in Deuteronomy, where he looks at them and says, you guys... In Leviticus, the, when they're laying out the law, he says to them, guys, you follow my ways? Ha <laughs> ha Abraham followed my ways. Abraham followed blindly. God said what? And he says, hey, I want you to go this direction. He didn't tell him a point B. He just told Abraham, you're in point A. I want you to go to a point B, but I'm not going to tell you. Just go in this direction. Sure enough, Abraham's like, all right, he gathered everything, he gathered his family, he packed up, and he just started going that direction. Some of us, for some reason, we have to know our point B before we allow God to actually give us our instruction. Oh, God, I'm not going to move until you tell me. You know, one of the things I, uh, to dote on my, my new youth pastors, you know, Philip, let's do this. He knew that God told him to do this. Philip still needs a job. That's pretty awesome, right? Some of you are like, that's stupid. <laughs> no, it's not. God is showing up faithfully in his life right now. He has not gone without, nor will he go without, because I know how my God works. Right. And so for some of you in this room, when God gives you instruction, you go with it. Right. All right? The provision will be met. I promise you the provision will be met. I've seen it. Actually, I keep saying this. My wife and I, I've noticed this the past few weeks. I keep saying the word, I promise you. I've got to stop this. Because as your pastor, I don't promise jack squat. Okay? It's not me. It's God's promise. 
So I'm going to correct myself if I say it any more during this sermon. So I'm, I'm apologizing for the past few weeks that I kept saying, I promise. It's not my promises. This is God's promise. And that's what Daniel is revealing. When he sees his people, Daniel's Jerusalem, he sees all of the Israelites, he sees these, the folks of what's happened, he's realizing they've forgotten the promises of God. They've turned their back on him and they're doing their own thing. And so he sees it's about, about to take place. The 70 years, he's added it up. And he's realized, in the prophet, in the book of Jeremiah, he's realizing, oh, uh-oh, we're, we're about to end. And when it's about to come to this end, it's going to be devastating. And something's got to take place. So he finds himself on his hands and knees. And he says in verse 18 of chapter 9, Oh, my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act for your for your own sake. Do not delay. Oh, my God, for your people and your city bear your name. And then in verse 23, the angel appears and he says to Daniel, he says, the moment you began praying, a command was given. Guys, there's power in prayer. There is power in prayer. In James chapter 5, verse 16, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You guys, remember how I spoke earlier about the advantage that's been given to us, the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit lives and dwells inside of us like never before, like never before. In Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit came, even before the Holy Spirit came down, Jesus told his disciples to do nothing until that moment because they knew the power. Jesus knew the power that was necessary. And so for us, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. When the zeal of God captures you, It ignites you with a great passion to want to walk with God in everything you do. When that passion just overwhelms you and consumes you, those things that are distracting, all of the things the world has for you, it just fades away and you just become excited about the zeal for God. You, I want, God, I want to know more. I want to know your ways. I want to, I want to see everything that you have for me and those around me. I want to be an effective instrument for the word of God. I want to be everything. You've been given this advantage. You know, it's through Christ. It's through Christ that you can explore the glorious riches of knowing God like they did. And we see this in John chapter 15 and 15. It says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. And since I have told you everything, the father told me. God is revealing these things to you. Why? Because you have accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and personal Savior. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Guys, these scriptures are confirming that what Jesus Christ did on the cross and the Holy Spirit coming and living and dwelling inside of us, it changes the atmosphere. When what? When we recognize the power of the righteous prayer. Because we have the ability to pray now. This is the same prayer. If you continue to read James chapter 5, you'll find that Elijah was able to pray and the, and the rain ceased. Three and some years later, he prayed again and the rain came down. You'll say stupid things, and I say that meaningfully, stupid, amplified. Let's go with it. Ignorant, crazy, blind, stupid. When you say things like, well, that was Elijah. You just completely disqualified yourself. You you treat human nature of understanding like Elijah was a LeBron James, and you're Kevin Love. Some of you are not like sports people, and that's okay. Guys, that's 
how you feel. You're like, oh, it's LeBron. It's like, I can't do what he does. It doesn't work like that. Jesus brought it to an even playing field. Jesus brought it to an even playing field where now when you accept Jesus Christ, we're all lined up evenly. It's just a matter of who wants to lean in. Who wants to say, I want to know what you're saying. Peter looked at John separate by like, because what happened? There was a posture in, in John. There was a posture here. And, and that's what I want you to read. If, if you get in the word in John chapter 13, there was a posture that took place. See, Peter wasn't doing what John was doing. Peter was out here. John was over there. What was the posture that John was doing? John was leaning in. It says that he was leaning on Jesus. I don't know about you guys. I'm a touchy person. But some of you, you only let certain people lean in on you. Otherwise, they're creepers, right? Some, some people, are, you're like, what are you touching me for? Guys, when, it's the posture of leaning in. I want, God, I want, I want to know what you're saying. That's the difference. Everyone's on an even playing field. The minute you say, well, that's Elijah, you just did this. You put some weird barrier. That's Enoch. That's Daniel. That's John. No, that's choice. That's all that is. That's choice. A choice to say, I want to know what my father is saying. I want to know what God wants out of my life. I want to be a part of something greater. What you do in the secret place is what gives you the ability to do it in the public place. And all you got to do in the secret place is just go, God, what's up? God, what are you, what's going on? I want to know more. I want to be in your presence. I want to have what you, what you have for me. Tell me. I want to know the unique design. And remember this, the secret place is not, it's not the destination. It's not the, the secret place isn't the, the place where it's like, that's, that's it. That's the pinnacle. It's just the catalyst. It's the catalyst place. It's the place that projects you, catapults you into the place where God has for you. It's in the secret place that you hear the things of God. It's in the secret place where it's you are set apart from this world. It's the secret place where you realize I am unique. God does have a unique design for me. That's the beauty about being a Christian, because it all becomes more real than ever before, more real than Daniel chapter seven. In the sense for your own sake, you realize how unique you are, because when God tells you to do something and you do it, you realize it's beyond your ability and you can look back and go, I know, I know God's real because I couldn't have done that alone. I couldn't, have been, I couldn't have been the solo artist on this. My God used me in such a way that only He saw this through. That's what's so wonderful about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, or sorry, chapter 9 verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Because that's that right there. I pray for prosperity over my entire life. Everything that I put my hand to. When I read scriptures like this, I, I run with those. I don't use scriptures like that and go, um, that's for somebody else. No, that's for you. Now, operate in it operate and walk in that. Right. Some people try to, they, they, you disqualify yourself because you feel like you need to humble yourself with that scripture and be like, oh, it's the meek. I better not do that. That's self-righteous. No, it's not. He says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. It wasn't that you in some things at sometimes and having some things that you kind of need, you will come sometimes not really abound all the time in some good things. So every, there's like two things that everyone knows about the word of God. It's, I don't care if you don't know Jesus, you know these two things. 
I, I promise you, you know these two things. The first thing you know about the Word of God is this, that there's a blasphemy scripture. You don't know where it's at. No one ever knows where the blasphemy scripture is. But you know that if you accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and personal Savior, and that then years, whatever, or months or weeks or whatever, you decide to deny him, that's called blasphemy. You're like, oh yeah, I know that one. Everyone's like, that's the impartable sin. You immediately go straight to hell. Everyone knows that. The second thing you always know is you can't add to the word of God or take away from the word of God. Everyone knows that. Yeah, you're not allowed to do that. Those two things, everyone knows. So, with knowing that, with the second one here, how can you, remember what I said in Daniel chapter 9? That, that Daniel read Jeremiah absolutes, not figuratively, absolutes. So when you read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You guys need to make a quality decision today to look only to God as your source. Because that's, right. that's exactly what Enoch, Daniel, and John did. They made a quality decision over their life. The quality decision was, is I'm not going to blend things together with the Word of God. I'm not going to add to it or take away. I'm going to have God as my source and that's what I'm going to do. So in those times of trouble, in those times of heartache, in those times of mishap, whatever it is, you don't sit here and try to find a natural way out of it. You go to the spiritual way and you say, all right, God, what do you have for me? Right. And you sit upon that. That's your solution. You don't stand on the problem and keep telling everybody about your problem. Whoa, it's me. I broke my toe at the pool the other day. I'm sure it's broken. There's black and blue. And all I want to do is show everybody about how my toe's broken. My parents were over last night. Mom's walk, my mom walked in. What do you think I'm going to do? Oh, mom, <laughs> my broken toe. <laughs> Why? Because my mom's going to give me the most affection, the most attention. Oh, honey, how did you do that? Right, I told my mother-in-law, the first thing my mother-in-law is, she's like, she doesn't stand on the problem. My mother-in-law is like, have you prayed for it? Did you put ice on it? It's my mother-in-law. If you women have ever been to a women's conference, you know. My mom will stand on the word of God as well, but my mom will give me the affection I'm looking for. Because why? I'm her little boy, right? Some of you guys want to be like, look at every, look at this. Look at my bank account. Look at all these things wrong with me. That's standing on your problem. Go to the solution. That's the issue that Daniel was having. Daniel was pointing out. He knew that all the people kept, they kept standing on the problem. They kept going, oh, yeah, yeah, we denied, we denied God and all his promises. We just, you know, they weren't changing anything, though. Daniel saw it to be, it was about to come to fruition. He said, oh, man, the 70 years are almost up. So what did he do? Sackcloth, ash. Fasting. He got on his hands and knees. God, I come before you for your mercy. I come before you for forgiveness because our ways have been wrong. Correct our hearts so that why? So we can have the promises that you've given us and not receive the curses of not receiving your promises. You guys, some of you are sitting in this room going, my bank account, I got 10 bucks. I don't have any money to give. Now, this is where everyone gets really frustrating are frustrated because they look at the prosperity message and they just kill it real quick. They kill it and they go, oh yeah, prosperity message, here he is. Give money in the offering plate and all of your cares will be taken away. <laughs> that's what you think. You're like, you think that that's the message that I'm preaching. That's not the message that I'm preaching. The message that I'm preaching is, is God's promises of knowing those promises. Actually, I believe that if you gave out of compulsion, or you gave this morning, it would be out of compulsion. That if you gave in that nature of like, I feel like I have to, because Pastor Josh just said it. It's getting the revelation of why you're giving, and then you'll see the fruit from it. Because when you grab a hold of the revelation of the promises of God, you know what it is. You realize that my God will bless us abundantly. Because if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 9 prior to verse 8, you would realize, oh, there's a mandate 
of what God is telling me so that my house is blessed, blessed in abundance. And when I follow this and I lean in on his scripture and his solution and not the problem, then my needs will be met. How? Abundantly, all the time, everything you need, every good work. That is the solution. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, but godliness actually is a source of great gain when accompanied by contentment. This is the amplified version. That contentment which comes from a sense of inner confidence based on the sufficiency of God. Prosperity is not a message taught where it's about what you can get. Prosperity is a message of talking about being contentment with God, of knowing that He's your source. That's prosperity. Oh, I can't wait to be in the presence of God. Every need, all the time, will be met for every good work that needs to be accomplished. I can't wait. I'm leaning in on God. God's going to show up. And when He shows up, oh, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be the right way. That's, right. That's, good. That's how you lean in on this. So Daniel comes to him out of mercifulness and saying, God, please, I plead with you because I know what we've done wrong. I know the errors and the wicked ways of, the, of your people. And I want this corrected. So for some of you in this room, you're not walking in the promise. You're not, work, you're not walking in the way that Enoch walked with God. You're not walking with the identity that John had of knowing that he was loved. You're not fervently reading his word and leaning into the truths of what God has for you so that you know how to operate. And I, I'm telling you, it's the most important thing thing you can do. It's the most important thing. I'm, this is my last thing, and i, I got to finish. It, unfortunately, we don't have VCRs anymore. <laughs> because there's a, a blatant, there's a blatant like, thing that happens with a VCR. DVDs now, you can plug your Ethernet in the back of them and, and and they just tell you, or you don't even have DVD players anymore. And so now you don't have what? You don't have that blinking stupid light at you because you failed to read the instruction manual to tell you how to set the clock. A better example, you who are just horrible at reading your car manual and daylight savings time, and you're still back an hour because you haven't decided to set your new clock on your dash. But back to the blinking moment. Some of you were just content all through the 90s and the 80s for that thing just to blink 12 at you. And you were okay with it. Super annoying. Get the manual out and fix the time. That's the same thing for you in this room with the issues that are in your life. If you're dealing with something in your life, get the manual and figure out how to get it. How to fix the problem. To hear the solution. Amen. That's, this is it. And so Daniel did what? He read Jeremiah. If Daniel wouldn't have read Jeremiah, the course of history would be completely different for today. And if for some crazy reason you still didn't understand my message this morning, don't sit here and say, well, Daniel's a difference maker, so I'm, I'm down here. That's ignorant. You are a difference maker. Right. By reading the word of God, you're actually changing the course of history right now. Amen. You have the ability to be a history maker. Now it's time to step up and do the due diligence and read the word of God to not continue to stand on the problem, but to, to present the solution. That's it. Amen. Do you want to live cursed or do you want to live blessed? Daniel said, I'm not going to live cursed. I'm going to live in the promises of God. And so he saw what was about to take place and he said, uh-uh, I'm, I'm going to find myself on my hands and knees and praying to God in heaven. You guys, some of you, you're a train wreck. And I mean that out of a heart, not out of a, a conjecture of being funny with you. As a heart of love and compassion as your pastor, I don't want to see you hit a brick wall. I don't want to see you crash my heart for you this morning is that you grab a hold of the solution and you run with it. 
That's what I want because, guys, when you read the Word of God, the revelation comes to you just like Daniel had when he read Jeremiah. Oh, this is what I need to be doing. Yes, that's what I need to be doing. Let's pray.